Sydney's Queen Victoria building has stood majestically for over 120 years. Its magnificent Romanesque style of architecture stands as a testament to the level of detail and craftsmanship of a bygone era. The heritage listed shopping arcade stands three stories tall and its central dome rises 60 metres into the air, which stood proud against the late 19th century Sydney skyline. So why were there repeated calls for its demolition in the late 1950s and 60s? Let's take a look. I'm Mike and this is Sydney History. The origins of the Queen Victoria building can be traced back to 1810, when Governor Macquarie moved the city's produce markets from the bustling rocks area to an area on the outskirts of town. The site bound by Druitt, York, Market and George Street was chosen due to its close proximity to Darling Harbour and Parramatta Road, which provided excellent road and water transportation links in the rapidly growing settlement. The markets proved to be incredibly successful at this location, and convict architect Francis Greenway was instructed to design a new marketplace under the direction of Governor Richard Burke. Greenway's design incorporated a dome building which was later converted for use as a police station and courthouse. The rest of the block was made up of a large cross-shaped market house. In 1846, the site was granted to the Sydney City Council for the minuscule rent of one farthing a year, under the condition that the site continued to be used as a marketplace. But by the late 1870s, critics of the market started lobbying for their relocation and demolition of the site. They hated the look of the rundown state of the buildings, as well as the associated activity, noises and smells, in an area that was now the heart of Sydney's civic centre and business district. A new multi-storey town hall symbolising one of the finest examples of Victorian architecture in Sydney was being built across the street. This was in total contrast when compared to the rundown state of the central markets across the road. Council was eager to transform the area and turn the markets into a luxurious shopping arcade the likes of which Sydney had never seen before, but legally they couldn't change the function of the site as per the 1846 agreement. In order to move forward with the shopping arcade and gain the necessary approvals, provision was made for a fruit and vegetable market in the basement of the grand new building, with a hydraulic lift to transport horses and wagons from street level to the basement level marketplace below. In 1891, Council pushed forward with their plan to demolish the old markets, followed by the police station and courthouse soon after. Young city architect George McRae was tasked with coming up with a design for the new building. Excited to leave his mark on the town of Sydney, McRae didn't disappoint. He produced four designs that would match the scale and significance of the city's new town hall next door. Council selected the Romanesque facade design, and they didn't waste any time, starting construction in 1893. The colossal building proceeded at lightning pace and took four years and eight months to complete. A pick and shovel worker could earn five shillings a day and the project became a symbol of economic recovery as the town and nation emerged from a harsh recession triggered by the Australian banking crisis of 1893. The monolithic three-storey sandstone structure was completed in 1898 and the building was officially opened with the name Queen Victoria Market Building. It was full of natural light and spacious, with a long colonnade arcade running through the ground floor. The interiors were grand and lavishly decorated, and they were intended to be a spectacle in their own right, as much as they were for shopping. Early tenants of the Queen Victoria building consisted of household names like Penfolds Wines and Singer Sewing Machines. Other retailers included tailors, bootmakers, herbalists and corset fitters, just to name a few. Level 1 consisted of 17 large showrooms, including one of Quang Tart's famous tea houses. The second floor included 12 large rooms, including a gallery, and Level 3 was perhaps the greatest of them all, with the large coffee palace at the Druitt Street Inn, playing host to lavish dining rooms, galleries, and 57 bedrooms for guests. At the Market Street End, there was a large cavernous 13-metre tall concert hall, spanning two levels. However, all the splendour wasn't enough to make the Queen Victoria building a financial success, and only 47 of the shops were tenanted in the first year of operation, and year after year the building continued to run at a loss. As the years went on, Council became desperate to turn the building's fortunes around in any way they could. At one stage the building was offered to the railways as a future potential train station for the new underground railway being planned, but the offer was rejected. In 1917, the decision was made that remodelling the building was the answer, with work commencing in 1918. The renovations were major and brutal. In an effort to maximise floor space and rent, the voided areas between floors were reduced. This in turn reduced the natural light that penetrated through to the levels below. The ground floor tessellated tiles were concreted over and the building's stone columns were boxed in. 
Even the 13 metre high concert hall was converted into a three storey library. The renovations ultimately stripped the building of its impressive decorative interior spaces and dulled its character. Sadly for the council, the renovations didn't improve the building's fortunes. In 1933, it was announced that the accumulated debt was over £500,000, and in 1935, the Sydney County Council Electricity Department moved in and became the major tenant. In turn, more modifications were made. They completely filled in what was left of the voids between levels and even went as far as removing the building's centrepiece, its inner stained glass dome. By this time, the building was fully desecrated and public resentment continued to grow. By the late 1950s, Lord Mayor of Sydney, Harry Jensen, was calling for the building's immediate demolition in favour of a new town square and underground car park. The car park would fund the demolition of the QVB and the creation of the new public square. Jensen's plan had widespread backing in the community and the public's disdain for the QVB was reflected in the newspaper articles of the time. Even renowned Sydney architect Harry Seidler once said, It's an architectural monstrosity, a wasteful, stupid building. However, plans for the building's demolition were postponed, as the city's electricity department still occupied the premises and needed additional time to vacate as their new headquarters were being finished off across the street. In 1963, some minor demolition works commenced, with the removal of the smallest cupolas on the roof, which were sold to souvenir hunters and some turned into garden decorations. By the time the 1970s rolled in, opinions were changing, and by 1971 the new city council had gained a better understanding and appreciation of the building's heritage value, and agreed to preserve it. It was later classified by the National Trust in 1974. As the 1980s commenced, Council entered into a profit-sharing agreement with the developer for the building's restoration, which included a new underground car park and pedestrian links to Town Hall Station and Pitt Street Mall. The restoration was a massive and risky undertaking, requiring the demolition of internal layers, including offices, floors and partitions. The Queen Victoria building was reopened in 1986 by then Premier Barry Unsworth, and after 100 years, it finally became one of Sydney's most popular shopping arcades and tourist attractions. Okay, everyone, that was Sydney's Queen Victoria building. Do you think the railway should have taken up council's offer and turned the basement into a railway station? Or do you think the site would have better served as a town square, kind of like Trafalgar Square in London? Or maybe, just maybe, everything turned out just right. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comments section below. And if you like this video, please consider subscribing and supporting us on Patreon. And remember, history's full of surprises. I'm Mike. Thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next one.